Alright guys, time for a game that's been on my to-do list for a while, but I just never got to doing it. Welcome to Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers based off the Disney Afternoon cartoon that I absolutely loved as a kid. Okay gang, we have a new assignment. Our cute little neighbor, Mandy, has lost her kitten. I can't do the chipmunk voices, obviously. I say this is a job for the Rescue Rangers. I'll go on ahead, Chip, and scatter some things of mine that might help while we search the city. Good idea, Gadget. That's the spirit, Dale. You and I can start on the trail. Monty, why don't you and Zipper track down one of those strange mechanical dogs we've been seeing in the park lately? Mechanical dogs? Yeah, piece of cake, Chip. We'll get right on it. You can depend on us. Mind you, one of the major issues is the fact that I don't like... I can't do girl voices and I don't like speeding up my voice. And the game starts off and Chippendale Rescue Rangers is... Just a run and bop platformer. Chip and Dale only have one major ability, and that's the fact they can pick up and throw boxes and uh, sometimes bigger things like that apple at enemies. Uh, Chip and Dale themselves, I believe, are entirely different graphically, and that's about it. I'm playing as Chip over Dale because I like Indiana Jones more than Magnum P.I. Uh, but this game does have one thing that's pretty notable about it, and that's that it has complete co-op where two players can play as Chip or Dale. Uh, together and that actually opens up the way to some speedrun ideas Because Chip and Dale can stand on each other's heads or others crates to try and get boosts off There's a reason that while this LP is about 30 minutes long uh, Start to end There's a reason that the speedrun records are like just under 10 minutes uh, Single player like nine and a half co-op you can actually do some really broken things with it Big boxes like that are generally going to hold some more special items for you. We, like, we get Zipper here, who's, uh, invincibility, uh, straight up. Nothing can touch you, and Zipper will actually go right after any enemy he sees. Now, you've seen these little panels all over the place, the flowers. Uh, those are essentially your coins, in that when you get 100 of them, a glowing star will appear on the left side of the screen. I believe it's always the left, and if you grab that, it's a one-up. There are also standard, uh, completely white stars that if you collect 20 of will also cause a one-up to spawn. You won't be seeing, uh, too many of that happening on this LP because I think I end with like 150, uh, flowers. But just, it's a good idea to grab as many as you can because you can really get a lot of extra lives. And one thing you're going to see me doing a lot in this game, or at least a fair amount, is dying. Uh, Chip and Dale is one of those games where the life system is that you start with three, I think it is, and then you have two continues, so you have a total of nine lives to start, but it's so easy to get extra lives, you'll probably only ever get one game over, if even. Uh, I usually get one, because by the time I'm at the point where I'm not only comfortable with the game again... Let me start that sentence over. By the time I'm comfortable with the way the game controls again, I'm usually already one game over down. Though, uh, I mentioned earlier, this game is like 10 minutes doing a speedrun. There is actually a reason for that, and I'll go over that in a moment. Uh, what I just grabbed there was an acorn that is uh, health restorative. Uh, you start with three hearts, and you only can ever have three hearts in this game. And time for our first boss, this lightning machine thing. I don't really know what the deal with this thing is, but the way bosses work, you get a little invincible ball like this, and you throw it into them five times. Every single boss has the same amount of HP, I believe. Uh, maybe one notwithstanding, and they can be very easy. Though there is a faster way to do the fights like that, and it involves catching the ball after you throw it. After every single stage, there's a bonus stage, and you generally want to get to the very top on the middle, because there's usually a one up there. <laughs> I tricked you, rescue rangers. The kitten was just a clever trap to lure you here. I've already caught your precious gadgets. From now on, she's inventing things for me. You'll have to take her from my casino if you really want her back. This is our stage select, which actually presents us with some options. You don't need to play every single stage in Rescue Rangers to beat it. Uh, you only need to play, I think it's... C, D, F, G, and the intro stage and a couple others. But we'll get more into that, but that is uh, later. I actually do like that stage select system a lot, but I am playing every stage for this, so you don't need to worry about missing anything here. Uh, one thing I should mention is I did- actually, no, there's two things, because they just saw me do that. Uh, first off, back in the bonus stage, the extra life that I was talking about that I actually didn't end up getting, it's actually been calculated to, I believe, be 90%- uh, to be a 90% chance of being there. And that was my only game over. From here on, I'm gonna be a lot better with lives. Now, the thing is with the box throwing, 
is that you can throw things directly up and they will bounce back down, but you can also press down to hide beneath the box and if an enemy touches it, they'll take damage, but you'll lose the box. Uh, second boss for me is this owl, which flies left to right, dropping feathers and occasionally diving at you. That's all it does. But if you are very good with your inputs, uh, you saw me do it there almost, where the ball fell right back on top of me. You can pick the balls you throw right back up and throw them again. That's actually how speedrunners beat bosses so quickly. Hi guys, don't worry. I'm okay so far. I rigged up this wireless phone when Fat Cat wasn't looking. And I sent a carrier pigeon with a map that shows how to find me. Listen carefully. You'll need to shut off some water pipes to get through Zone B. Just jump on the tap. Zipper's waiting to lend a hand in Zone C. Uh-oh. Gotta run. And in between stages, you get little briefings like that from Gadget. Uh, one thing I should mention... Uh, there are actually no two things. I just, I just heard that. Uh... You might hear every now and then the audio cut out. What that is, is either me starting a new recording session for each level, or checking my notes, because I actually, I, even though I've played this game before, it had been about eight years since I last touched this game, so I had to do a practice run right down when I remember being there. Although this stage is actually not very threatening for enemies, because these bears that throw out little, or I guess, drop wine on you, uh, they don't really have a real good chance of hitting you if you just kind of stand there. These are the taps that Gadget was talking about earlier, by the way. Just jump on their, uh, their handle three times and they'll turn off. Uh, I do believe that you don't get every hint in the game if you just go through the shortest path, but uh, the game is simple enough to the point where there's not enough you can do to really make it big puzzles. Also, that uh, don't fall in the pots. That's one kill. Uh, one kill, uh, a bottomless pit. There we go, that's the term. One thing you should keep an eye out, by the way, for, especially in this stage, is little house flies that fly right towards you like that guy would have. They can be kind of deceptively bad in terms of running into them. Uh, earlier, I picked up a glowing acorn. That's a full health restore. Uh, there was a bomb earlier, which, if you pick it up, has a short time before it explodes, but I think it might do more damage. And I just picked up a pee bottle. Uh, there aren't too many of those in the game, but what they are, are power bottles. Uh, what that allows you to do is, say if you picked up, like, one of the giant apples in the earlier stages, or this stage, uh, normally, when you were holding them, you'd run slower, but if you have the pee bottle, you actually run at normal speed. Uh, the spaceship here is probably the most annoying boss the game has to offer normally, because these little aliens and drops are really annoying. Uh, if, you tr if you're careful, you can actually get two shots in at once, and even more careful, you can actually take the ball hitting you, you to confuse you as invincibility frames to completely avoid getting hit. And doing so can actually make the game pretty easy in most instances. Uh, I can think of a couple opportunities to use it, uh, right off the top of my head at least. Careful, guys! I just shot Shaw? Saw Fat Cat send some tough-looking characters to Zone D. Also, watch out for fallen iron balls. Throw something at the switch to stop them. Cool, thanks. On to Area C. Uh, Area C is the first of one of two stages in the game that doesn't act- No, three stages. That doesn't have a boss fight. This is basically a platforming stage entirely. I'm not sure if it's actually faster to go after stage B or C. Uh, I guess speedruns know that for a fact, but uh, most of the time when I'm playing the game, I actually do go for this stage because it just feels a bit faster to me due to the lack of boss fight. Now these kangaroos, which are really small for kangaroos actually, can be fairly annoying because, at least when you're an uh, early player, figuring out the timing for those tennis balls can be a little bit tricky. Either way, I, I just remembered something I was going to go into earlier. Something I actually really love about this game is... Uh, the level aesthetics. Uh, they actually get pretty interesting with the whole, you know, you're a chipmunk and things can be kind of big in comparison to you idea. Because I, I always love gimmicks like this. In fact, that's one of the reasons I'm really looking forward to uh, Kingdom Hearts 3 is the Toy Story world. Because I can't wait to see what they do with the scale of the world in that. Now, in terms of my experience with Chip and Dale, the show, I... Uh, there were three Disney Afternoon cartoons I watched more than any of the others. Or at least of that era. It was... Chip and Dale. Uh... Tailspin. And... 
uh, for a time, it, the, the third one was Darkwing Duck, but nowadays, even though it's technically not the same era of Disney Afternoon, uh, it's Gargoyles, because I love Gargoyles. I also really enjoyed the old uh, Disney Renaissance cartoon uh, spin-offs, like the Hercules cartoon, the Tarzan cartoon. Those are really good. And there goes a one-up. Careful, guys. I just saw Fat Cat send some tough-looking characters to Area D. Also, watch out for Fallen Iron Balls. Throw something at the switches to stop them. So there are some that you'll all actually get repetitive hints for if you go for all the levels because they're warning you about the next level. Also, I said someone did, did someone say Toy Store level? Uh, even though the game came out later than I'm about to talk about, this level always reminded me of one stage in one of the PlayStation One Rugrats games. I forget the name of it in t precisely, but it's the one where you're playing as all the four babies going around Tommy's house and finding basically. Uh, Mario 64 missions, like there's one where it's mini golf and you can go into a pyramid to find some reptar cookies, I think it was. Uh, there's one level in particular where you're in a toy store with that giant gorilla toy that terrified everyone as a kid. I also remember there was one where you go into Tommy's basement and you're just surrounded by Mr. Friends and that's, uh, that's just not good for anyone. Uh, these spinning enemies are actually some of the most annoying in the game. Uh, the way they work is that they'll do two moves. They'll spin around, and then they'll bob back and forth. When they bob back and forth, it can actually be very annoying to get around them. Though this room can also be fairly annoying if you don't know where the rabbits are ahead of time, because the little carpet waves they send you can be pretty annoying. Those chickens are also kind of annoying because uh, they take multiple hits for one thing, and any boxes they come across, they will punt out of the way. Uh, you actually don't need to trigger the switches here, like... Uh, Gadget was telling us to because you can actually just either get in between the uh, spawns of the iron balls or just flat out damage boost your way through them if you know how to control yourself correctly. Uh, but you should just hold right here because otherwise you're taking damage. Uh, one thing I believe Rescue Rangers 2 did, I say believe because it's been even longer since I last played that, is I believe they also gave you an option to get more health, and you don't get that at all here. Mind you, three hits is a good round-off number for an NES game. Heck, it, it's better than Mario in any game that's not Super Mario Bros. 2 USA when you have more than three health points. <laughs> but it, it, it's still worth warning you about. Also, uh, flower overkill much? Uh, you can check how many lives, flowers, and stars you have, by the way, by pressing select, like I just did right there. Uh, and that can be pretty good in terms of remembering where your next life is. Next boss is this robot, which I... Well, that's just completely unavoidable, isn't it? Uh, I actually always have a lot of trouble telling exactly where you have to hit on this guy. It's either on his little light bulb nipples, or his belly. I think you can just out... Yeah, you can just outright hit both. But you want to be careful because... That can still be kind of hard to hit because learning how to jump and throw at your, uh, at, yeah, at the target you want to like that can actually take a bit of learning to do. But hey, at least you can get two hits in pretty easily like that if you are lucky. Also, the only way you can really get every box in a special stage like that is if you have two players. I'll have to vote for you to use to get across the water in Zone E. Oh, by the way, I nearly fell into a hole zone in Zone F. Watch your step. And now you have a choice. If you just want to get to the end of the game, just go to F, but I want to go to E first. And E is actually one of my favorite aesthetics in the game. Uh, the little loose planks that you can see, I forget if they damage you the moment they start shaking or if they fall on top of you. I think if you just touch them outright, you will get damaged. We also get one of my least favorite enemies in the game, those weird looking beetle guys, because uh, they can be tricky to hit. Uh, don't, they're not vulnerable until their entire sprite shows up, and even then, hitting them on that first jump can be kind of tricky. Or at least in terms of timing it. Well, that said, though, I love those clods in the background. Uh, speaking of two-player, though, uh, one thing that two-player does a bit differently is that I believe it's closer to Battletoads in terms of how the life system works. Uh, in that when one player dies, the other, if the other's still alive, you don't reset and all that. Also, that one up there is actually kind of tricky to figure out how to get because you have to actually j uh, throw up at that one and then jump through his little hole. That seems pretty simple, but you'd be surprised how long it took young me to think of that. 
And here is that boat Gadget was talking about. Uh, you control it. There's no enemies along the path here, so it makes me wonder what the purpose of this even is, except to get across that fountain. Unique set piece, I suppose. We also get the hammer, which also only appears here, which you use to break down this wall. And you'd be surprised how effective this is against enemies. You might think in a game where you have so little health points, getting closer to an enemy is a very bad idea, and you're mostly right. But if you just mash the B button, enemies don't get much of a chance to even get close enough to you. Uh, whenever you find a giant pile up of boxes like this, I do recommend going through most of them. Because you'll very often find either a flower, a star, or an acorn in them, making the trek through it fairly worth it. Uh, I'm not sure about the ant lions, actually. I don't- I, I feel as if they're instant kill, and it might just be their pits. Because I try not to touch them, obviously. They look like they would be, though, given experience in other games. Also, a notable thing that's kind of annoying about this game. Uh, that little jingle you hear when you get an extra life, that also happens when you unpause the game. But we do get probably the hardest boss in the game here, if not the second hardest. The electric fish, who just loves to throw way too many lightning bolts at you at a time. Uh, best way I can go about, say, go about this, uh, get lucky. Uh, it's not a hard boss all the same, but you'd be surprised how easy it is to get hit. Uh, you could theoretically use the ball to push yourself through some invincibility frames, though. That is an advisable stratagem. But with that... Watch out for the pipes in Zone F2. They change size. Okay, thank you. But with that, I'm going to need to end this off here. Thank you guys for watching. And in part two, we're going to go finish off the game, actually. See you guys then.